Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. I also upload technique videos on Tuesdays, and in both types of videos, I always leave direct links down in the video description that allows you to jump from one section to another. This is going to be a short casual Friday because I was out of town most of the week. I have an update on King Charles I's uh, knitted waistcoat that I told you about last week and its relationship with another topic I've talked about, which is Danish night sweaters. Then we're going to talk about finish at February. I'm going to update you on my Roaring Twenties vintage sweater. And then I want to talk a little bit about the collection of vintage knitting manuals that I'm collecting that you can see behind me. So let's get started. Last week I was talking about an article of clothing that King Charles I of England wore to his execution. That garment will be on display at the Museum of London this fall in an exhibition called Executions. It's only been on exhibit on display one time previously about 25 years ago I think some somewhere around there so it's kind of an exciting thing to see and it it was um, I believe he was executed in 1649 maybe 1647 but the the shirt was dated to around 1647 and it's a knitted silk shirt one of the frustrations I was having about it, because I'm very excited to find out about this, but I, I'm not going to be able to go see it at the museum, and I was hoping for a better photograph of it online so that I could really zoom in and look at it. So I got a, a number of different comments and messages from people in response to that, and which led me to a photograph that that is higher resolution. I was able to get a little bit closer look at it, but not as close as I would have liked. But it was close enough for me to kind of get a sense of how many uh, stitches per, per inch there probably were, which is about 15. But another person commented that it was known that, that this shirt was a, a texture pattern. That was what I couldn't really tell as if it was textured or color work because the pattern was clear, clearly looked or appeared to be two different colors, but that is an illusion based on the texture. And this type of knitting is, is, is called damask um, knitting. And that references a woven cloth with the same name and that has that sort of same illusion where the the light reflects off the stitches differently and it makes it look like there's different colors when there really aren't. So that was that was good to know that it was texture. One of the things that was kind of at the back of my head when I thought maybe it was textured and I knew that it was silk and it was very fine gauge and obviously it was knitted for a king was that Danish night sweaters or Danish star sweaters, depending on how you want to refer to them in English, are traditional Danish sweaters that were worn up until somewhere in the 19th century as one of the layers of clothing that women wore. And I talked about them this fall when I was uh, showing you this book, Traditional Danish Sweaters. And I, because because I wonder, I knew from reading this book that these uh, wool knitted sweaters were based on imported silk versions that the wealthy people wore. So I wondered if those that knitted silk shirt that Charles I wore, if that was the type of shirt that got imported to Denmark that these traditional night sweaters were based on. And somebody sent me a link to a book. Uh, to a title of a book and a chapter of the book within that that is related to all this. The book is called Fashionable Encounters, Perspectives and Trends in Textile and Dress in the Early Modern Nordic World. And the particular chapter that, that relates to all of this is chapter five called Silk Knitted Waistcoats, a 17th Century Fashion Item. And that chapter was written, I'm probably going to ruin the name, I think it's either May or Mai Ringard. 
my apologies to that person for not pronouncing their name correctly. <laughs> I've been out of town most of the week, and so I'd only been able to skim that article so far, And but what I've seen of it does refer to those um, traditional nightshirts um, that were actually worn day and night, but the that they do um, relate to those specific shirts. And they were talking about this damask knitted versus brocade. And brocade indicated that you were knitting with other colored threads, like often gold and silver threads. So there was color work going on where damask referred to just a single color and it was using texture, knit pearl um, patterns in order to create um, the, the design. There is a pattern, it's in one of the Walker treasuries and you can find it online too, but there is a stitch pattern called King Charles Brocade, which it probably should be called King Charles Damask instead, but it's called King Charles Brocade, but it, but it shows you how to knit that sort of diamond pattern that's on the, the upper part of the bodice of King Charles's. Uh, shirt. So that was all really interesting to, to find that there were all these other connections and there are other resources for finding out more information about not just that shirt in particular, but the fashion of those knitted waistcoats or knitted vests or knitted undershirts, however you want to uh, refer to them, what the fashion of that was at that time, and then the examples that do exist. Um, I, this article, the chapter in that book, it does focus on uh, the Nordic countries and the examples of it, but they do refer to the shirt that King Charles wore and, and the differences between his shirt and the other all the other shirts that they found in the Nordic countries. So I'll leave links down below to the stitch pattern. I'll tell you which of Walker's treasury that you can find that King Charles brocade pattern, as well as a link to the book online where you can read that chapter on Silk Waste Coast, because I think it's really interesting. And if it's something you're interested in, uh, you might want um, to read more about it. I'll also leave a link to this traditional Danish sweaters book down below as well. I was out of town most of this week until late last night, so I have not made any progress on my green yarn that I'm spinning, but hopefully this weekend I can start getting caught up on things. In case you're not aware of what Finish It February is, it's a, a time to go through all of your UFOs, your unfinished objects in your, in your various bins and bags and closets and pull them all out and really just assess whether or not you think you ever are going to finish these things. And if you are, to see how many of them you can get through in this particular month. And then once the month is over, you can go continue on with all of your new knitting, but it's a way to just kind of deal with this stuff that maybe has been hanging over your head for years. So a lot of you have been making great progress. There, some people have been finishing sweat, baby sweaters that were intended for their children who are now in their 30s, and they, they're, they've been surprised at how little work there really was to be done. Oftentimes the work that's left to be done is finishing work, either seaming or little duplicate stitching or weaving in ends or just the little bits. And some people have remarked about how they remember putting it to the side thinking, oh, is it the, that there were problems that they were going to have to try to solve or it just seemed overwhelming to get all of the, the finishing work done. And as they're addressing the things now, they realize it really isn't as much work as they had had in their head that it was. So that's one of the great things about just going through and assessing things is just giving yourself a reality check and saying, I am never going to finish this. I'm just going to rip it all out and return the yarn to my stash. Or, well, that's not so bad. I'll just finish this up. And then it's a load off of your shoulders. So However it works for you is the way that works best. I do want to congratulate those of you who are making great progress on your unfinished objects. It's just, it's such a great feeling when you can do that. So when we went out of town this week, we were down in Arizona. Uh, my father-in-law is in a rehab facility, and so we were spending a lot of time visiting with him. And so I took along my Roaring Twenties sweater to work on. I didn't make as much progress as I would have if I was at home, but um, it's more important to spend time with family than to uh, make a lot of progress on a knitting project. I am about 
just at the top of the shoulders. This sweater starts at the bottom of the back, goes up to the underarms, you cast on for the sleeves, you knit the sleeves, and you bind off the sleeves, and then you knit down the front. And, and while you are working the sleeves, you also bind off for the neck and do all the neck shaping. So I'm at the top of the shoulders at this point, and you'd think that would mean I was 50% of the way through, but I'm about 42, 43% of the way through because the front is larger than the back and because all of the finishing bits, the cuffs and the little squares that form the collar that are crocheted, those little bits are almost 10% of the sweater. It always surprises me at what a large percentage of the project something like button bands and neck bands can be, um, but it's no different for this particular project. It's not a cardigan, but it does have quite an elaborate collar and the cuffs are knit separately from the rest of the sweater. So I'm about 43% of the way done. So here, here's what the sweater looks like so far. You've got the, the body right here and I've got the sleeves coming out on each side. I've got, um, I bound off for the center of the back. You can see how narrow the back is. It's only about three and a half, four inches wide. It's, I've noticed that vintage and antique sweaters have much narrower backs of the neck. The necks are much closer uh, surrounding the neck. They're not as wide. Like contemporary sweaters are not only just a little bit bigger, they're a lot, in many cases, they're very, very wide. So, um, the necks tend to be much closer at the back. Um, and so at this point, I'm working only on the sleeve over here. And these little bits that are separated are the parts that form the slashes at the base of the sort of bloused out uh, sleeve. And so now I've put this side over here on a circular needle and it will just sit there until I have gotten to the bottom of the V-neck. And then I'll go back and I'll finish the, uh, this sleeve right here until I'm at the bottom of the V and then I will join the two pieces together and I will continue down the front. I don't know if you can see that there's a blue string hanging down on the bottom um, and it's holding the, the base of the sleeve together. The, the pattern calls for just casting on the number of stitches that you need. I decided to do a provisional cast on and so that I have live stitches. And then when I finish the sleeve, I will have live stitches as well. And I'm planning on grafting uh, the sleeves. Rather than seaming them, I'll do a graft all the way. I don't know how far up I'll do because I'm going to need some more room in the underarm and I don't know how much I'm going to need. I won't know that until I actually finish the sweater and I can kind of get it together and figure out how much room I'm going to need. I mentioned, I've mentioned before that the model in this original sweater, which was only created in one size, I knew she was smaller because women 100 years ago were smaller. But she was really tiny based on how much additional length I had to add to the sleeves and, and how much I had to add to the body and, and how you can see the sweater fits her. Um, I, she was very tiny. She, maybe she was five feet tall. A lot of people have looked at that sweater and, and remarked about how low the neckline was. And the thing is, I know exactly what that neckline is going to measure and it is not going to come down that low on me. It's because I'm longer. So it, it's kind of interesting. This sweater, I'm sizing it up to fit me, but it, it's not going to fit me the way it fits that model because I'm not wearing, first of all, I'm not five feet tall. And secondly, I'm not using shapewear that flattens me out everywhere the way they would in the, in the 20s. So it'll be interesting to see how this sweater actually <laughs> looks on me compared to how it looks on someone who is probably 20 years old and six inches shorter. So we'll see. Uh, one of the things that I get asked every time I finish one of these vintage sweaters is if I plan to publish my version of the sweater. And the answer is always no. That the reason I'm knitting these is so that I can learn something from them. I can learn something about the design, about fashion, about that construction method. And I'm doing this in the context of also having it so that it fits me. Um, but I'm not really interested in figuring out a range of sizes in it and then writing up modern instructions for them. 
in many cases, the instructions, in most cases, the instructions are actually pretty straightforward. The problem is with the sizing differences and any of the sizing changes I've had to make previous to this have been pretty simple if I've had to do any at, at all. Um, this one, every time you think about changing something, it has an effect on everything else. So if I wanted, to, for example, to make the neckline look as low on me as it looks on the model, I would actually have to make it longer. I'd have to make it more rows longer so that it would hit me at the same place. That is going to change the circumference of the neckline, which means it's going to change the number of the little squares that I would need um, to create the collar. And as the collar is right now, there are 12 of those squares. Six of them are in the this kind of uh, beigey color. And then there's two each of red, blue, and yellow. So if I made the circumference bigger, I would either have to make the squares larger, which would kind of change, it would, it would just make the collar bigger in all sorts of ways, or I'd have to find a way to add more squares to the, to the collar. And then it would either have to, I'd have to do that in increments of two, but really increments of four inches because I would need to add another colored square and another beige square. So this is the, this is the challenge that I've had at every stage is if I add more width, how does that change how the motifs are spread out? If I add more length, how do I add more length without changing the way that the, that the horizontal stripes that include the motifs are created? If I wanted to add more circumference to the sleeve, how do I do that? Uh, without adding too much a circumference to the bottom of the sleeve because it's the circumference is meant to be the same all the way around. So every, every time I make a change, it just gets magnified because it, it impacts other things in the garment as well. So the answer is no, I'm not going to write up a pattern for this. I do have my notes in my Ravelry project page, which is always linked down in the description. You can read my notes and you can watch the videos in which I talk about it and, and I share the challenges and the, my solutions with it. So this particular sweater is way more challenging than any of the others that I have done. I had no idea it would be this much more challenging. I knew what what some of the challenges were going to be, but mostly I was interested in learning about some of the design elements that I hadn't seen before. And I really didn't expect that there was going to be this much calculating and, and experimenting and doing mock-ups of things prior to um, being able to actually knit certain parts of the sweater. It's still really fun and I still really enjoy it. What I would not enjoy is trying to figure out how to size this for multiple sizes. It's really hard enough to try to modify it for any other size at all. Um, and it would, be, it would just be impossible <laughs> to do for multiple sizes. So last week I was telling you about a, a knitting manual I bought called the Columbia Book of Knitting and Crocheting that was published here in the United States in 1936. I also, when I, when I ordered that book from a bookseller, I ordered the entire eight book series that were written by Jane Coster and Margaret Murray back in the 1940s. And they were published by Odom's Press, which is in the UK. And this was, would have been during uh, World War II that these were being published. There was a book published almost every year, so the eight books between 1940 and 1949. Uh, some of the books were reprinted. The first one in particular, I am, have gotten the impression that that one was the most popular and was reprinted multiple times. So I've gotten some clues online about how to tell when the, the copy of the book that I have was actually printed and I can compare that to when the book was first published. Um, so one of the things about these books is that they often have really interesting end pages. So let's see this one right here. 
has these really cool end pages where you they're knitting related. You can see the balls of yarn and the hands that are knitting. Those are really cool. And then I also found out from a blog post I found online, there's a way to find out when a book the copy that you're that you are looking at was actually printed and sometimes these are at the end of the book and sometimes that they're at the beginning but at the bottom of the page right here it will say it says s144 and so the one stands for january and then the 44 stands for 1944 so i know this particular one was was printed in 1944 but the first one that I have this Practical Knitting Illustrated, which was the first and most popular book, this one doesn't have any end pages um, that, are, that are special. And there's nothing in here anywhere that I can find that indicates when it was printed. So I've been looking through each of these to, to, so I can kind of figure out, do I have a first edition copy or is this a reprint? Um, but I don't have all eight books yet. I only have seven of them. I'm still waiting for the eighth. And once the eighth one comes, I'm going to sit down and compare all of the books sort of to get a, an overview about what these books all have and what is different about each book. Uh, one of the things that I've seen so far is that they, they're mostly garments and they're for garments for the whole family. And they have um, people, you know, for different ages, they have children, they have women, they have men, they have older women, they have different sweaters for older women <laughs> than they have for the young women. And then they, they had, I've seen certain sections in some of the books about how to use up your scraps, because I was kind of wondering about, well, in World War II, if things were rationed, how easy would it have been for people to come by new uh, wool yarn to make new garments and one of the books that I just got in the mail today has an entire section on knitting new things from old things and so I'm going to be really interested in looking at that and seeing the kinds of tips they give. One thing I noticed about the very first book was that it had more sort of instruction for knitting they all have how to cast on, how to knit, how to increase, how to decrease, but there was more information about uh, garment finishing work and things like that in the very first book. So I'll be curious to see if that, any of that gets repeated in subsequent books. And I'm really interested to see if some of their advice that they give for sort of best practices changes from the first book to the last book. So I wanna look at each book individually and I wanna look at them as a whole. And I also wanna see if they repeat any patterns from one book to the other. If there's certain patterns that they repeat over and over, because for publishing a book that large with that can contain that many patterns year after year after year, I'm wondering if they're recycling some of the patterns or not because they're certainly recycling their, their book titles. <laughs> the eight books are titled this way. Practical Knitting Illustrated, Knitting for All, Complete Home Knitting, Knitted Garments for All, Modern Knitting, Practical Family Knitting, Knitting Illustrated, and Complete Family Knitting. So there's really sort of three or four titles that are just re rehashed and uh, words are reordered in order to create new ones. So I'm cu curious to see if the contents inside is sort of uh, recycled and reused or if it's all unique things one year after another. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group. Rocks, rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.